Len gave me a picture of, of what it would be like to be a better, holier me later on in life. Like, I don't, I don't know if you have anybody in your life that does that for you, but like I grew up and everybody around me kept telling me that the things that I really enjoyed were, were, were wrong, but I couldn't reconcile it. Like, I really loved dragons. I thought dragons were really cool. I like science fiction novels. I like the heroism of, of dragons. Sometimes in sci-fi, you, you get dragons that are wise and shrewd that teach people. And everybody in my church was like, no, man, you can't, you can't like dragons. They're, they're bad. And I really like griffins. You know, griffins are composite creatures, you know, and they're, they're little bits of, of maybe lions or little bits of, of, of birds, and they're brought together. And it just seemed to me like so, so magical, so beautiful. And everybody in my church was like, no, you can't like those. They're bad. No dragons. No griffins. No, I just really like monsters. You know, I just thought it's something gargantuan, something, something at scale that sort of just was impressive. People, you, you can't like monsters. And then I, I had all these great heroes, you know, Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Chesterton, you know, and they, they all smoked tobacco pipes. And I was like, oh, I, I really like the smell of that, the way that it looks and everything. You can't, you can't like pipes and be a Christian. So I was like, man, no dragons. No griffins, no monsters, no pipes. Like, this sucks. And then I meet Len, and I go to his house, and it's decorated in dragons. Because in the Bible, the seraphim, the worshiping angels that surround the throne of God are, are literally translated fiery flying serpents. Dragons worship the Creator. And then I look over, and there's, there's, there's uh, griffins composite creatures, because in the Bible, if you study what, what the cherubim are, what the living creatures are in the Bible, guess what? They're, they're griffins. And, and, then, and then you go in Linton's house, there's all these weird knickknacks of, of monstrous creations, because all the way through the Bible, in, in Hebrew, there's these things called the tenin, the tenin, and, and they're these glorious billboards of God's creative majesty and power, and then he, he smokes pipes. So I go to Len's house, and I see this, this, this environment in which God is made Lord of the imagination. And all the things that once upon a time people with, with less experience, and less education, with a more narrow understanding of what it means to find it, just all the stuff that they told, said was wrong, was wrong, was wrong. Len found me a way not, not to just make bad things good, no, no, but to broaden and deepen my understanding of goodness, of creativity, of imagination, and he did it through the scriptures. He didn't do it through an opinion. He did it through the sacred word of creator God revealed to us. And Len taught me what it means to follow Jesus Christ through and with my imagination. And man, I learned so much from him. I'm so glad to share him with you today. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, mentor, Len Sweet. Is this a great day or what? Is this a great church or what? Is this a great team, worship team, or what? Whoa, unbelievable. Kevin, I want to give you a standing ovation for that. Uh, I looked at Thane, who plays a little guitar, and said, could you do that? Uh, and is this a great pastor or what? And, uh, every professor, every mentor hopes for a student that will one day not just succeed him, but surpass him. And this is, this is my future right here, I hope. I hope. Uh, don't you disappoint me, David. Uh, but uh, I greet you in the name of the one who is, who was, and what's the last one? Is to come. Now, that's the, that's the literal meaning of the Aramaic word with which the Bible ends. We translate it, Maranatha, as what? Come, Lord Jesus. No, it's in three tenses in Aramaic. Come, the one who has come, the one who is come, and the one who is to come. So I greet you this morning in that ancient greeting of the early church in, Mer in Aramaic that comes in Three tenses, tenses. Now, we have a three-generational God. It's always amazing to me. We, we miss this. Everyone wants to focus on this generation and that generation. But we have a God who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think about it. This is how God wants to be known. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob. And I'm going to take just a little moment of personal privilege this morning and celebrate that we have three generations of sweets here this morning. And my son and his wife, Maggie, who's a, a native Jacksonian, is that what you call yourself? A Jacksonian? Um, they are here with a three-month-old grandson and his name. So we all stand up. This is Stane and this is Maggie, Margaret Rose Mauer Sweet. And uh, this is little Theo Michael Sweet. And we have right here a God of three generations, a God of Leonard, Thane, and Theo. And I'm just so proud of you all and so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here. My wife, Tia, is here too. Tia, will you stand up? Uh, this, is, this is Tia. And uh, she is here holding the baby for kind of hogging the baby most time. But uh, at any rate, I, I want us to look this morning at the importance of beginnings and how they connect to endings. And in your beginning is also your ending. I am insistent that every one of us has a right to our birth story for this very reason. It is important that parents tell as much as they can and pass on as much as they can of the birth story of their children to their children. And my mother didn't do all this with me, and so I'm kind of, you know, what your parents don't do with you, you kind of do with your kids. But you need to know how you were born, when you were born, why you were born. I mean, who was around you when you were born? Who was there at your birth? I mean, we know Jesus' birth story pretty well, or at least we think we do. But we need to know our birth story. And it's not just a birth story of being born, a birth story of beginning. So this morning, I want to deal with Jesus' beginnings as the Messiah. And these are his birth stories for his ministry, his coming to terms with and coming out, if you will. He comes out in these readings we're going to have this morning. He comes out as the Messiah. Now, he was a little reluctant to come out, but he had a mama, a Jewish mama, who said, it's time for you to come out. You've been 30 years hanging out. Uh, it's time to come out. And Jesus initially said, you remember the story? I'm not ready yet. And then um, she didn't argue with him. She just, you know, I'm sure she gave him that look, that mama look. And um, so let's read the story. But then we're going to know, we're going to look at the story of Jesus coming out as the Messiah, but also his coming out as a preacher. He preached before, but this is the first sermon that we know about, and it's a sermon that he preached in his hometown. Now, when you go back to your hometown, sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's, it's not so good. And this is a story of Jesus' hometown reception of his first sermon to them after he come out as the Messiah. Just to um, kind of prepare you for this, Jesus gave us a sacrament of failure. Sometimes they will not receive you, Jesus said to his disciples. Sometimes you will knock on their door and they will not open it. And what do you do? What do we do then, the disciples want to know, when we stand before a door, stand before a people, and stand in your name and give your story, and they want nothing to do with us. How do we handle it? And Jesus, speaking from personal experience, said, you remember the story? Shake the dust off your feet and move on. In other words, you don't succeed without failing. All of us fail to succeed. You, nobody succeeds in life without what? Failing. You can't succeed without failing. But when you do fail, you don't let it immobilize you. You don't let it just uh, deteriorate you to the point that you, you can't, you freeze. You go, keep moving. I love Eric, my favorite Willie Nelson song, Still is Still Moving to Me. Isn't that great? He wrote it himself. He says it's his favorite song, too. Still is still moving to me. So even when we're still in prayer, we're still moving. And so keep, even when they fail to receive you, just, I call it the sacramental shuffle, all right? 
if you see me doing this morning, you know, doing this, you'll know what I'm doing here. Yeah. No, they just keep moving. And I think Jesus, when he gave his disciples this little, this little ritual, just shake the dust off your feet and keep moving, go to the next door. He's thinking about this story we're going to read this morning. But what happens in his hometown? His very relatives, because Nazareth is a small place, and everybody's basically Mary's relatives. Part of his own family. Can't believe that one of our own from Jackson is claiming to be what? The Messiah? So, here we go. Let's start with the, the first miracle, and then we'll go to the, the first the first sermon. Now, this is the first miracle. John, John has seven signs that testify to Jesus' authority as a Messiah. The other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, don't do signs so much as they do stories. The stories, the authority of his stories, the authorities of his witness himself. Um, but here we have the first of seven signs, and this is one of my, my favorites right here. It's a wedding that Jesus attended with his disciples, and this wedding, they ran out of what? Yeah, they ran out of wine. Now, one of the worst things that can happen to a host is you run out of food before you run out of guests. And some of you, just, you can feel the shivers up your spine right now. You know, We got more guests coming, we have no more food. This is especially so in the first century because weddings were the most significant event in the life of a family. Now, it's very different back then, because today, who pays for the wedding? The father of the... Uh, yeah. Back then, the father of brides paid for nothing for marriages. I mean, it was good if you were a father of bride back then, because the, you got paid, you didn't have to pay. I mean, you got paid a dowry, you got paid presents, you got paid... Part of the, part of the dowry could go on for 10 years. I mean, so you, you were in receiving mode. If you're the father of the groom, okay, you pay. And they would save for a lifetime because how you treat your guests at your son's wedding, especially your oldest son's wedding, but how you treat your guests is a reflection of who you are and what your stature in the community and how good a host you are. These were multi-day events. We have an idea where you come to a wedding reception and it's an afternoon. No, these were like seven days. You, you, you took the whole kit and caboodle family and you went to somebody's wedding feast, wedding reception, and you camped out. So it's like a camp, camp meeting. And you go camping. And the host is supposed to feed you for as long as you are there, as long as you're a guest. So here we have the story of what happens. Now, it starts out on the third day. And I'm going to say the reason why it starts out on the third day is this is John's way of connecting to the third day of creation. Because on the third day of creation, God created, are you ready? Wine. Now, I grew up in a tradition where Jesus turned water into grape juice. It was not wine. I don't think I need to argue that with you. Uh, maybe I do, but I'm not going to. My, in fact, I, I heard a preacher once who says it was Welch's grape juice, you know. I mean, you can't fix stupid. I mean, Welch wasn't invented until the 19th century. I mean, come on. So, at any rate, no, this is wine. And the quality of your wine reflected partly on, on your, your, your ability as a host and how much hospitality you showed. So, here we go. And where are my glasses? You know, three days later, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited when they ran out of wine. Now, now so there is a little intimation here. First of all, you know, if Mary's involved when something goes wrong at a wedding, you're not just a guest, you're part of the family that's hosting it. You know what I mean? Because the extended family looks bad if something happens to one member. So somehow, we're not sure how, but Mary is related, and Jesus is related to whoever's getting married here, and it's on his mother's side. Now, there's also a suggestion that in the way this is written, in the tenses involved, that Jesus and his disciples didn't get there early, they got there late. Okay. 
over seven days, and they got there like the fourth or the fifth day. There's also this intimation that they were part of the reason why they ran out of wine. Now, that's a whole other you know, conversation about Jesus and the 12. And, uh, but the point is, Mary is trying to do something to save the day. When they ran out of wine, since the wine provided for the wedding was all finished, the mother of Jesus said to him, Jesus, they have no wine. Jesus replies, woman, why turn to me? My hour has not yet come. Now his mother at this point, Mary, so Jesus is saying, if I do this miracle, if I save the day here, this is a sign that I am a Messiah. One of the signs of the Messiah is that he turns water into wine. He, he's, he brings new wine, the best wine. So this is a messianic symbol here. Um, and he says, I'm not ready yet. Now notice Mary doesn't argue with them, you know. She just kind of gives him that mama glare, I think, as he says, I'm not ready yet, my time has not yet come, ignores him, okay? And here's what she says next. And she says to the servants, you do whatever he tells you. In other words, he's going to tell them something. Regardless of what you say, Jesus, you're my son. It's been 30 years we waited. It's time. And so she ignores his saying, I'm not ready yet. And she says, do whatever he tells you. There were six stone water jars standing there meant for the ablutions that are customary among the Jews. Each could hold 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. Draw some out now, he told them, and take it to the steward. They did this. The steward tasted the water. And it had turned into wine, having no idea where it came from. Only the servants who had drawn the water knew the steward. The steward is like the caterer, you know. The caterer calls the bridegroom and says, people generally serve the best wine first and keep the cheapest sort till the guests have had plenty to drink, but you have kept the best wine till now. And this was the first of the signs given by Jesus. It was given at Cana in Galilee. He let his glory be seen. And his disciples believed in him. Jackson, Michigan. I spent a lot of time in Dayton, Ohio. We had the same problem. Water. The key to good anything, whether it's coffee, wine, beer, lemonade, is you got to have what? Good water. And the one thing you don't trust, at least when I was in Dayton, Ohio, is the tap water. The best water. Notice, Jesus, the best wine ever made in the history of the world, it comes from distilled water, purified jars, purified water, holy water, if you will. So making good coffee is not just about and Jesus showed here, it's not just about the grape or the bean. It's also about start with the right water. You didn't know how relevant the Bible was, did you? I mean, and he starts with the white water. Now, here's the, here's the mystery to me, and we, we don't have time to go into this, but this is, you got to use your biblical imagination here, your sacred imagination, your sanctified imagination. Jesus always, when he healed anything or, or did a miracle, he always had leftovers. Jesus is always leaving leftovers. And after he made this wine that everybody's tasting and going, oh, we never tasted anything like this before. This is the best wine everybody's ever had. Where did this come from? Right. Did you ever think about this? Jesus is the master vintner. I mean, 30 A.D. vintage, best wine ever made. It's harder to get in a, it's called an M.W., a master of wine. It's harder to get an M.W. degree than a Ph.D. degree. And Jesus is the greatest M.W., master of wine that ever lived. And he makes this incredible wine that people can't stop talking about. And, and, and the word spreads. And some of the other, we have stories about the, wor the word spreading about this incredible wine that nobody's ever tasted anything so good before. 
and there's all this wine left over. Now, here's where your imagination comes in. If you're reading the Bible imaginatively in a sacred, sanctified way, in a biblical way, you got a question, what happened to all those extra wines? We got 600 bottles, at least, of wine Jesus made. I mean, there's no way that many, there are that many people there. Nobody can drink that much. So what happened to all those hundreds and hundreds of bottles of wine that were left over? Where'd they go? Who got them? Is there still one out there? There's a novel waiting to be written. But forget about the, you know, the chalice. <laughs> what about the wine that went in it? Where is it? Well, we do know that since weddings were so expensive, that if you had leftover wine from your marriage feast, um, you would offer it up for auction. A couple days later, you could put it up for auction. Or sometimes immediately after the wedding. It was, it was really wide, um, wide variation. And the guests and some other people who had heard about the wine, whether it was good or not, would bid on it. And uh, that was a way in which the bridegroom's father could defray some of the expenses of the, of the wedding. So think about this. So if, indeed, um, some of this Jesus wine, you know, last year a bottle of wine sold for $131,000 at auction. So if some of this Jesus wine came up for auction back then, who would have been there to bid on it? Wow. Well, once the work got out, this is the greatest wine anybody's ever tasted, you know, I guarantee you who's going to be there, servants of Caiapha, servants of Herod, servants of Pilate. They're going to be at this auction bidding on, uh, you know, um, which just stimulate, let your, when you read the story, kick your imagination in gear. Now, this is, you, you can't say, well, the Bible says this. No, but it's a good, let's talk to our kids about this kind of stuff. Let's get them involved. And in, what do you think might have happened to that, those extra bottles of beer? No, extra um, bottles of wine on the wall. Where did they go? Who might have had them? Could there still be one out there? Now, this is the first sign that Jesus is the Messiah. It's a wedding feast, a marriage feast. The number one sign of the kingdom of God is a what? Feast. If you're reading the Bible and you're not getting hungry, you're not reading it right. Because Jesus is a foodie. He's always eating. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open it, I will enter. And it ends there, right? No, I'll enter, and you better have some food ready because I'm going to come in and sup with you. Hey. The symbol of God, the symbol of heaven is a banquet, a messianic banquet, a marriage banquet, the marriage of the lamb. And the bride and the bridegroom come together, and Jesus and his church are united. Okay, well, so let's see what the first sermon is. Here we go. This is Luke 4. And he came to Nazareth. We have been brought up. And he went into the synagogue, went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as he usually did. He stood up to read. And they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written. Okay, now you've got to picture this. You've got to picture this. It was probably an outdoor synagogue. Nazareth very small. We're talking about these are all Mary's relatives, only a couple hundred people. They're all re related. Um, Jesus, on the Sabbath, comes out. They created an outdoor synagogue, probably a table. And he stands in front of the table, and they give him, they take out of the ark, they give him the scroll of Isaiah. He can go anywhere in Isaiah and pick anything. And he himself picks, on the spot, for his first coming out sermon at his hometown. Isaiah, 58 and 61. But he picks these passages not even in order, okay? So as he's reading them, as you, he's not really reading them from the scroll. He's reading them by heart. I mean, I could open up the Bible and look like I'm reading it, but I can actually read it by heart, some of it. 
And when Jesus reads it by heart, he doesn't even go in order. He starts with 61 first, and then he goes to 58. And he doesn't get any, he doesn't get the exact quotation right. Because when you take something in by heart, when you learn it by heart, you make it your own. So each of you is writing in your own heart a new message Bible. You're translating the Bible into your own heart, into your own language. When it comes out, it doesn't come out exact. It shouldn't come out exact. Jesus never once quoted the Bible exactly as it is in the original scripture. Because he's quoting it from heart. Do you know the Bible that well? you know the stories that well? That when you tell them, you're telling them in your own words. You're true and faithful to the story, but they're coming out. And that's what Jesus is doing here. So he is, his first sermon, this is his text. It's Isaiah 61 and 58 mashed together. It's a mashup. Here we go. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written. Again, it's not written in this order, but this is what he's going to do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me. All right, that's pretty big. He has sent me to bring. He's got a five point mission. You got a mission point across the street. This is Jesus' mission statement. I don't know what your mission statement is. But this is Jesus' mission statement. It's got five points. We got a mission story, which is changing water to wine at a wedding feast. That's the mission image and mission story. But here's the mission statement. He has anointed me, number one, are you ready? To proclaim good news to the poor. Let's stop there. If it's not good for news for the poor, it's not good news. If it's not a gospel for the poor, it's not a Jesus gospel. If you're hearing good news and it doesn't have good news for the poor, it's another gospel. Number two. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives. In other words, freedom for prisoners. Jesus had a tender heart for prison ministry. Jackson. Jesus is always talking about what are you all doing about the prisoners about the captives in fact he lived as he preached and he died on the cross with two people on each side of him and he's still ministering to the prisoners at his death because those two people on either side of him were what thieves robbers brought from prison and the first convert in heaven is a convict a prisoner. Today you will be with me where? In heaven. He has anointed me, bring good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the prisoners, to the blind new sight. Now really the blind means here to those sick and diseased healing. Um, we talked this week, earliest translation of Jesus saves. I grew up singing a song, you have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. Anybody? Am I the only one? Thank you. You're saving me right now. <laughs> Jesus saves. Forget that. The original Greek. We have heard the joyful sound. The Greek is sozo. Jesus heals. Jesus heals. Jesus heals the wounded. He heals the brokenhearted. He heals the downcast. He heals the... Yes, they're saved. Saving is also a health word. Saving and salve are the same word. No, ointment, anointing ointment, oil of healing. But the real fundamental concept here is that Jesus heals all our diseases of mind, body, and spirit. Now, the next one is he frees releases the oppressed. Now, the real oppressed here, when you think oppression, we think of economic oppression. But back here, you're oppressed by the devil. How are you oppressed by the devil? You can be oppressed economically. You can be oppressed physically. You can be oppressed emotionally. You can be oppressed and to the point where you're depressed. So oppression was a, hard, was a big, huge word that covered all sorts of things, not just 
you know, political and economic and other kinds of oppression. Um, it frees you from all those things that are dragging down your spirit and dragging down your life. And after those four things comes the biggie. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now you go, well, I just, now this is huge. The year of the Lord's favor is a special phrase. Every Hebrew would have known it. Because they didn't want to say the word because it was so holy and sacred and such a dream. But the year of the Lord's favor was a shorthand, we call it a sobrique, a shorthand for one word, jubilee. To bring in, Jesus is announcing, Jubilee. Now, when you heard that, you would have, your ears would have gone, whoa, you've got to be kidding me. See, the greatest dream of the Jews, when they thought of kingdom, and of, you know, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of the future, they thought of the word, they thought of this thing called Jubilee. Seven, three sacred numbers. Three and seven are most sacred, most perfect numbers. Okay. Seven, you got, you know, seven churches, you got seven signs, you got all these sevens. But seven squared, in other words, you, you per, the seven is the perfection, you square it, seven times seven is what? Yeah, 49. But if you add, so that's, that's perfection itself, squared. But if you add one to the seven times seven, to, to one to perfection, it means it's a whole new order, it's a whole new time, it's a whole new day, we're starting over, we're back to zero. So Jubilee, Matt, guess what? You freed all your prisoners. You freed all your slaves. You, fro you, fro fro you, you freed all your debts. What, what is that word? You, you forgave, yeah. You forgave your debts. So people in Jubilee, everything went back to zero. The land even was allowed to go lie fallow. You didn't till it in the 50th year because it was a time of jubilee. Everything started over. You forgave everyone, everything, and you went back to the beginning and started over in this new heaven and this new earth. And this is Jesus proclaiming that he is jubilee. He is to bring back. He's to... Good news to the poor. Freedom for the prisoners. Healing to all the sick. Freedom for all the oppressed. And all four were answered in that one word, Jubilee. And when his hometown heard these words, when he pronounced himself, Jubilee, they just got so excited that their local boy made good. Um... You know the rest of the story. They got so embarrassed and humiliated that one of their own would proclaim himself. Somebody who actually came out of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And here we got, they even thought that about themselves. And here we got somebody named Jesus who comes out of Nazareth proclaiming that he is Jubilee. What do they do next? Anybody remember? His own family, this is his own family, tried to do an honors killing. Let me repeat. Ever wonder why Jesus, when you read, he's not your focus on the family guy? Some of the harshest things he has to say are about family? Ever wonder why Jesus never had any of his disciples as one of his brothers or people that he grew up with in Nazareth? Because his own family, when he proclaimed in his first sermon, this is an interesting reaction to a first sermon. And he himself probably started shuffling at this point. But he did a fast shuffle because they were going to throw him off a cliff. You know what that means? Capital punishment took two forms for Jews. For Romans, it was crucifixion. For Jews, it was stoning, two ways of stoning. You put them in a pit, and you throw stones on, on top of them. Or you take them and throw them off a cliff, and they die on the rocks. That's the two ways of dealing at families dealt with disgrace, dishonor, and shame brought about by one of your kids. Here, Jesus' own family prepared 
to restore their prestige by taking care of this embarrassment. And Jesus shuffled out of there. See, he managed to escape their attempts to hurl him off a cliff. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is our jubilee. I talk about jubilee now, really, more than I talk about kingdom. Because the kingdom of God is Jesus. Jesus is jubilee. And we're going to sing a song just in a minute that talks about how freedom is a name, but it's a name for Jesus. And what we're going to do when we sing this song, I want you to see, when you see the word freedom, I want you to replace it with jubilee. Just that word. Because Jesus is your jubilee. Jesus is your freedom. Freedom for the poor. Freedom for the sick. Freedom for the prisoners. Freedom for the oppressed. Jesus is our freedom. And we need to live in the light every day of this freedom in Christ, this jubilee Jesus. And jubilee is a state of celebration, feasting, dancing, eating, conversation. Dare I say the word? Partying. His signage of what it is to live in jubilee. And his naming of himself as jubilee. One of the most radical revolutionary things in the history of the world. And it wasn't easy for him. And sometimes it's not going to be easy for us. But we stand in the presence of Jesus Jubilee. And in that state and in that power, we already sang about what God's Spirit wants to rise and do in us. This is exactly, this is a great description of Jubilee, and I didn't even know they were going to sing this this morning. Break down walls, beat down doors, crash through windows, and cover the earth, cover the earth with beauty, goodness, and truth. That's Jubilee. That's Jubilee. Whatever walls you got in your life, Jesus will break them down. He will beat down the doors. He will break through the windows and cover the earth, cover your life as Jubilee said no tilling of the soil for a year. We let it all go fallow and recover and recoup and heal. And that's the power of Jubilee. What a Savior we have. What a Jubilee. Let's sing in closing this last song, Jubilee. Instead of freedom, we're going to replace the word freedom with a lot. It's the sweet name. It's the powerful name. The name of Jubilee is Jesus. Jubilee has a name. And it is Jesus. The hope that the Hebrews had for the future, summed up in one word, for them, Jubilee. For us, the name is Jesus.